Now you look at the drivers and you look at their information. What you know what their you know top two or three issues are? Truck parking, compensation. Uh, those are big things, right? So you're like, okay, if I'm really trying to solve my problem, then I should consider this through their lens. What are the things that matter to them? If I can solve for that, then I'm going to go a long way in, in making people happy and providing a place for them to, to want to stick around for a long time. It's more than just a living, y'all. Hell, it's our way of life. We're the last of the cowboys to get up gone, boys. Eighteen wheels on the concrete. It's a slow and down breed. Rolling like Jesse James. A modern day outlaw game. If you're out here riding with me, come on back and make some noise. We're the last of the cowboys. Welcome back to Merging Lanes, the podcast where we have conversations with passionate people in the trucking industry. I have not said those words in a long, long time. Colson, it's been a minute. What's up, man? It has been a minute. Well, you're the one with the big news. Let's share your news. Well, okay. So since our last episode, I have graduated from physical therapy school and also passed board. So I am a licensed doctor of physical therapy, which is a, a big milestone in my life. And uh, my wife, Amanda, is same thing. We both passed with flying colors on the licensing exam. And it is like 100 pounds of weight off of our shoulders that's just been sitting there for the last like seven years. So I, I'm happy. I'm happy. And uh, I'm excited because uh, now it's full time on the trucking fitness company. Well, congratulations. I know you worked hard. I know that was a very busy uh, season in your life. So welcome to the other side of it. And I'm excited that we're uh, that we're here. And I'm, I'm pumped up about our guest today. He's, he's, a, he's a good friend and a rock star, too. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm ready to kick it off. In Alabama, uh, you know, across the country, lots going on in the, in the, in the world of, of trucking and, and advocacy. But, um, you know, especially if you're on the northern border of our country. But I don't think we're addressing that issue today. But, uh, uh, but certainly, uh, it's been a, a lot of that's been in the, in the media. Um, but uh, I'm just pumped up that we're back and uh let's get rocking and rolling man yeah i mean and today we've got an awesome guest uh jeremy reimer uh jeremy someone honestly i look up to in the trucking industry on an entrepreneurial level and also just from uh you know really going after a huge issue in the trucking industry uh coming from getting people in which is uh, other than what you know, you talked about from up go going on up north, the other big thing that everyone talks about, and from a driver shortage perspective, to you know, some topics we'll talk about today in the podcast. But he is the founder and CEO of Driver Reach and the host of uh, Freight Waves podcast, Taking the Higher Road, which I was on last week, and will be coming out uh, after this podcast comes out. Or yeah, before this podcast comes out. So, Jeremy, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. So great to see you guys. Yeah, man. And I'll, I'll have to be, I have to preface this with, I haven't seen Hamilton yet. And I was going to ask, can I borrow your uh, Disney Plus account? So I'm just kidding. Uh, okay, Mark, have you seen Hamilton? You gotta say, of course I've seen it. Okay, okay. It. Thank I'm you. Not in, unfortunately, <laughs> I've not seen it in person, but it's, it's absolutely fantastic. Got to see it, man. Okay, Jer last time we talked, Jeremy was saying that I had talking about uh, a song in that, and he was he was shocked I haven't seen it. So I wanted to kind of give him an update. I, it's on my to do list. The room where it happens, uh, man. That's 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 what it's all about. Um, well, Jeremy's. You know, I had a few uh, chances and opportunities to get to know Jeremy. The one thing I and he he doesn't know I'm going to say this, but the one thing about Jeremy that that, that I enjoy and being in and around him is not only are you, you, you learn a lot uh, about um, the trucking industry, but he's just an interesting guy. He's got a lot of knowledge in that, in that brain, but he's everywhere. He he's, it's like you turn around, he's on the cover of this magazine. He's doing the podcast. He's running his business. He's at this event or that event. And then, it, but when you're around him, he's just really calm. It's like, he's like the least busy guy ever. If you're talking to him, he doesn't seem busy. And so I've got a, I've got, I admire you too, Jeremy, for many reasons, but one is like, when I'm scrambling, I think people think I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm anxious. And so I've got to just be calm because 
you're you're everywhere uh i turn and when you talk to you're like oh, I'm, ch- I'm chill i'm cool man <laughs> so, uh welcome welcome to the podcast thank well, you I mean, go for uh, it real, uh, on the whole uh, hamilton thing how that came up is because i told mark uh on the podcast that he reminds me of alexander hamilton in the play where uh especially that song um not throwing away my shot mm-hmm. you know because just like my country, I'm young, young, scrappy, and hungry. You know what I mean? I was like, you're, you're driven, you're motivated, and it's just, it's fun. And, and, and I guess it's easy to be attracted to others who are passionate, you know, caring, engaged people. So you have to see it, and you can borrow my Disney Plus account. Yeah, yeah. well, this deal. sounds All right, like, deal. Yeah, this sounds like a common sense thing, but I, I have really come to appreciate in life getting to be around and work with people who are good at what they do, and who are passionate about what they do. If you spend your day, even if it's a field or a a topic that's just completely foreign to you, if you're around that kind of person that is just excellent and then also passionate, man, Mm -hmm. it makes everything fun. So we've got you here today and you're both. So, yes. uh, So uh, we haven't. Well, so I guess before we kind of dive too deep into it, I'd love just kind of talk through how you got into the trucking industry. Um. Well, it's, it's a fun story because close to that, a little over 18 years ago, I was in Southern California, worked on the Pacific Stock Exchange. That was my background in, in, in finance. Uh, and uh, the exchange closed. So in, in March, uh, May of 2001, it closed. And so, you know, I'm thinking, okay, well, most everybody on the trading floor went and just traded on their own. And I did the same. But I had this business opportunity in Indianapolis to small family business uh, in trucking, a driver staffing company. And I thought, Indiana, trucking, no thanks. I lived a block from the ocean, you know, um, but I, you know, started dating and my my wife, you know, Wendy, uh, we got married and she's like, "Ah, let's give it a shot. You know, we'll see what happens. We didn't have kids or anything yet. So we said, okay, if that's the case, then we're going to go. We're going to be all in. We're going to burn the boats and we're going to focus on, um, apparently this is a thing. And I think what, what, once I got to Indianapolis, I realized trucking is huge. I didn't, I didn't know that, right? Trucking is such a huge industry. And the demand for drivers was so strong. I didn't, you know, I understand the concept of staffing, but that's a big, you know, that's a big, I didn't realize that driver staffing was a thing. And so as I got into that, fast forward a few years later, I ended up buying the company. I ended up getting into a position where I could buy that uh, company. And then we grew that company significantly. And I started building technology. To, um, to help us operate more efficiently as we grew and expanded. And it was really that it, it's really, it's an exciting, one thing I realized going through that whole process is the, the, uh, the, the industry is really tight knit. I mean, as big as it is, you know, there's a lot of opportunities to engage with each other and every, there's this commonality it runs 24 seven and it's either you're either all in or you're probably not going to stick around very long. And so I, I love it. And uh, I, I frankly just couldn't imagine doing anything else. And then, so you went from the staffing company and then did that, was that a, you sold that and started a driver reach or was that a transition to driver reach and that eventually became it? Yeah, uh, good question. So I uh, I was building technology for the staffing company originally, and that was just really about helping me, you know, operate more efficiently, leveraging technology. Um, and then there's such a deficiency in technology and trucking, especially in the HR and recruiting space. And uh, there was one company that had been around for a really long time, and that was it. And so I recognized the opportunity to take some of what I had built, uh, market that, and then um, and I, I knew that with that, there was such a need. I knew I could help a heck of a lot more companies than I could with my staffing company. So kind of came to a, a kind of a fork in the road and I decided, all right, I'm going to sell the staffing company, use the proceeds from that to fund the growth uh, and, and sort of bootstrap driver reach and, uh, and started doing that in, in 2017, 18, 19. And, and, you know, of course, into the into what we call now the the global pandemic days. That's right. Gotcha. And then, so if you were going to give like an elevator pitch of, of what driver reach is, what does driver reach do? And, and yeah, what, 
Uh, so we help companies hire drivers faster and more efficiently. At the end of the day, we help them solve their their driver shortage challenges just through the through the use of technology. Uh, and I think it's really important to note that the technology doesn't replace the human. You know, hu- I mean, you're anybody who hires truck drivers without human to human. That's I don't know that that even exists. It's always going to involve a human engaging with a human, but just leveraging technology to provide a better experience. Uh, and a more efficient, you know, experience for the for the driver and for the carrier. Gotcha. And and so, I mean, I think that kind of goes into, you know, what you guys do on a day to day basis and getting drivers at, you know, recruiting drivers into trucking companies kind of goes into the big topic that, you know, we wanted to start this conversation off with was, you know, the driver shortage, which uh, is everywhere and everyone's trying to figure out a solution to it. And, um, you know, talking about, before this podcast we talked about a couple of different ideas and you know you seemed very passionate about a couple of them too and you know i think from a recruiting perspective and also just from your position being in the industry for i don't want to say 20 years 15 years or 15 years i don't want to offend you for how long have you been in the industry for uh just over 18. okay all right 18 years what do you what things do you think needs to change in, in trucking to you know help drive more people behind the wheel well, there's obviously an image concern or issue, right? We've been talking about that forever. When you have more drivers leave the industry every year than new entrants coming in, that's unsustainable. And I think that's why we're where we are. Um, and that's you know, COVID aside, like that's COVID accelerated or exacerbated it, but still COVID aside, that's still a dynamic year after year after year. That's just how it's been. And um, interestingly, I was talking to somebody the other day I remember, I don't remember when Shorty Winnington was the chairman of ATA, but I'm going to say it was, it was more than 10 years ago. And we were at an event and we were talking and we were talking about the concept of reducing the minimum age uh, from 21 to, you know, high school graduate age, 18 ish. And I said, Shorty, if we just do that, I think that changes everything. And, you know, obviously we're, we're closing in on a pilot program that uh, could provide us a lot of data, you know, towards that end. But I think that's a really big deal. And that's something that I've been passionate about for a long time. I'm excited that we're, we're closing in on it. Jeremy, just in that vein, I mean, image is one thing, and it's probably the most important thing. Mark and I talk about this a lot on here is perception, right? I mean, you can change a lot of facts, but if you don't also shift that perception, then in, in, in any area of life, then, then, then really the facts didn't matter. And so um, then, and unfortunately changing someone's perception about anything is extremely challenging. Um, I think from a, what, what people perceive to be a professional driver, obviously that the facts are changing about the roles of professional drivers as new generations have come, come into those roles. And obviously, uh, that's going to continue to change just a basic demographics. But but what are you? What are some of the things? If if you could say from a perception standpoint that that aren't true today, um, you know, and then things that maybe need to change uh, over some time that would uh, would would encourage more people to want to get in the trucking industry. Well, grease, smokestacks. I mean, sure, there's a combustible engine. You know, I mean, there is an element of that. But if you've stepped inside the cab of a truck in the last five, 10 years, it's a it's a it's an engine cockpit. I mean, and that's only improving year after year after year. Incredible technology that's built. But I think that anybody who's younger doesn't recognize that. Uh, So so I think that's an image issue uh, that, that, you know, stands to be corrected and and improved on. Uh, Obviously, this past uh, couple of years. We've gotten a lot, the industry's gotten a lot more uh, positive press, certainly truck drivers specifically going through, but we have to, we have to, you know, we can't let that go away. We have to keep banging that drum and making sure that that doesn't, because otherwise, as you just drive down the highway, billboard after billboard, you've been hit by a truck, I'm going to make you millions, you know, and and nuclear verdicts and, and the picture that they paint of the truck driver is somebody who probably couldn't get a job anywhere else, kind of last you know bastion of employment and and that's who's barreling down the highway 80,000 pounds so I think uh certainly getting more women into the industry would make a big difference and you know Ellen Voye and a number of others who are are focused on that 
effort are, are doing fantastic work. We have to continue to bang that drum as well. Because if you, it's just like, if it's a bunch of men, right? And if you're, it's like a bachelor's pad. What does that look like? You walk in there and say, oh, this is a nice image. No, it's, it's a disaster. But you have a nice, you know, a woman's touch to it and that changes everything. Now it looks really nice. I think that, that's, you know, I think that could go along with helping uh, the image of the industry. But again, I cannot, uh, you get younger drivers uh, into the industry. You get that first wave, especially. They reduce that minimum age from 21 to 18. And you get this first wave of tens of thousands, potentially new entrants coming into the industry. You know, think about it. These guys are, are you know, high school graduates. They, they um, were trained properly and they have working with a company that's got all this great safety equipment uh, provided. These guys are making money. They've never made 40 grand, 50 grand a year ever. ever. That's unheard of to them. And they're going to tell all their friends how they didn't have to go to college to get away from the house, which is probably the reason why at least half the people go to college after high school is just to get out of the house and be free. They were able to do that in a job and make really good money. And then and then that first wave is what attracts, you know, a lot of the rest. You talk about bringing that middle uh, or that age of a new entrant from 35, 38 ish down to, you know, probably closer to, you know, hopefully mid 20s or so. And that'll be a big deal. Absolutely. Uh, and some, I was in a, I was in a meeting recently and uh, we were, we we're just like you in the state of Alabama, working on the same public image, pat career pathways, all of those different areas that affect this issue. And uh, somebody said, well, what's your, what's your goal? I mean, do you want them to be a top three career choice for a high school student? I looked around, I was like top three, I'd settle for top 15 yeah. right now. Cause I mean, it's that we're not even in the mix. Right. Uh, where we need to be. And so that from a something that needs to change, I was like, I'm, I'm realistic. I would, yeah, I, we were 9, 10, 11. I would take that, the trucking career. So for a high school student. So we we're making progress. But but like you said, until that changes um, uh, kind of the norm of, of 18 year olds, knowing there's a career pathway for them uh, in the trucking industry, it's going to be a challenge. So we're, we're heading in the right direction. It's just going to take time. So. Well, and I know, Jeremy, I know you're involved um, and I'm involved with uh, Next Gen. And we actually had uh, Dave and Lindsay on the show uh, just talking about, you know, getting more high schoolers thinking about trucking. And, you know, right now, if they don't have the option to, well, I know a lot of some states do have the option of interstate driving, but if they don't have that, uh, you know, it's a mainstream thing where, hey, I can go be a driver. I just learned. I loved this class. It was my favorite class in high school. You know, you're getting in and now the now, you know, Dave's talking about, well, let's get them in at the warehouse level. And then it it when they turn 21, then they can become a driver. And it's just like going from step one uh, out of high school to like step two, three, maybe four. And like you said, you know, anytime there's just like, change of okay now it's a new career it just doesn't it doesn't feel it doesn't feel right compared to being having that option day one out of high school so i agree with that um it's like cart cart before the horse a little bit uh that's a tough it's a conundrum kind of that we're in because you're like okay well if, if you got to train people first before 18 year olds you know 18 19 and 20 year olds can, can drive well if they can't drive then i can't train them but you know what i mean and so you got to you know, kind of interesting fact. Um, first of all, I'm, I love uh, networking. I love inter introducing people. And one of the more prouder connections that I made in the last probably dozen years or more, I actually had, uh, I think I read an article that about Dave, Dave Dine. Uh, I read an article, reached out to him on LinkedIn, started engaging some dialogues. I really was excited about what he's doing. This is probably five years ago, four or five years ago, at least. And then Lindsay, I've known for a long time. We actually worked together at my staffing company and uh, got her into trucking. And, and, and I'm so, so proud of how she's embraced it. And uh, even though I sold the company and she went on, worked for Ryder before going full time with Next Gen, um, she was talking to me about this just passionate thing that she, you know, really wants to get involved with. And I, I introduced her to Dave and, and then they just they just ran with it. And it was so awesome. That's I, I'm so proud of, of both of them. Just really good people. That's, that's awesome. They are. And I, I was 
I was very honored that they uh, they and and I thought it was really cool that they're thinking outside the box about you know thinking other than just teaching them how to drive, but teaching them you know how to live a higher quality of life and and the work that we're able to do at the trucking fitness company with Next Gen and that's just gonna you know multiply our um, mission overall when you stack years and years and years of that and then if we can get them right into the industry at 18, I think uh, that's how some of these statistics on driver's health start to change. So that was, that's really exciting for me too. But um, this is kind of a personal question because I just, uh, from a recruiting standpoint, because I just don't know, I'm not in that world. And, you know, from, from my perspective, you know, I see like, you know, new people trying to get new drivers coming into the industry who aren't in trucking, right? And then you've got also companies who are recruiting drivers who maybe are owner operators right now, but are sick of that. And they just don't want to deal with, you know, the headaches of being their own boss and being an owner operator, or they're sick of the company that they're currently working at, and they want to jump to another company. How do you at driver reach, look at the different streams of recruiting? And then like, what, what is the, the largest stream that you guys are are working with right now? We have, I mean, customers of all different sizes. And at the end of the day, you know, whether they're hiring owner operators or they're hiring company drivers, whether they're a truck, a school, training school, at the end of the day, the process is the same. They have to go through the same process, highly regulated industry, right? So the application and all the background screening, you know, uh, components. So that all still has to happen. I think, the companies that are the most successful with recruiting, it's generally speaking, A, they've got a great reputation of how they are and how they behave. But there's still even that. It's not all the same because if you're a truck driver who uh, it, just being over the road is not an option anymore, right? Maybe you're a father. If you're, if you're a male, you're a father. Maybe you're a grandfather. You want to be around your, your children or your grandchildren. It's just so you... There's so many different uh, subsets, uh, you know, in the industry, you know, different, there's local and regional type work. Some people are okay with doing physical labor. Some people can't anymore. And so all of those things are really um, factors. But at the end of the day, when the average age of a new entrant is, you know, 35 to 38 you know, years old, that's generally what you're working with. And so, you know, the, the, the effort to attract younger drivers today it does you, you can't do anything with it. You know, you, you need to be able to, you need to be able to attract, um, you know, a, a, just fresher humans <laughs> into the industry who ha can have a much longer career. You know, the average age, I think, uh, overall is, in, you know, close to mid 50s. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, I think, like 10 plus years older than, than the average worker in the workforce otherwise. And in like the most sedentary, you know, uh, profession. And, you know, I mean, yeah. one of the things I failed to mention earlier when you asked about improving the image, just get in shape, take care of yourself, eat well, exercise. And not only will they feel better and last longer um, in their in their job, but they'll that'll improve the image of the industry just by itself. You know, you, you can get up and down out of the cab and not risk hurting yourself. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, I, had so I had a I, we have drivers on our podcast that I, on the other podcast I do for driver uh, for the trucking fitness company and the coolest thing that uh, I had a driver that I was interviewing and he had lost I think probably forty eight pounds he'd been in the industry for ten years but he just he got dared or he was in some challenge with his friends and he lost like forty pounds and and the biggest thing that struck me was he said. I feel 20 years younger and it's like, mm -hmm. holy crap. I mean, can, mm -hmm. can you just imagine what the quality of life feels like just being able to do that? But um, I guess this is another personal question because I I'm talking to the recruiting expert here. I just got to ask it when a new driver comes into the industry, is it more likely that that driver says, okay, I want to be a truck driver. So I'm going to go to a CDL school or is it, I'm going to go to a company who's then going to send me to a school. All of the above. I mean, it All really just, above, okay. yeah, it just depends. But that's still part of the process, right? For them to earn their CDL, there's a process, there's schooling that has to take place. There's a test. And then uh, you get your CDL. Un unfortunately, I don't know if it's a bad thing. Uh, this is just the way it is. Most new entrants into the industry, they're going to be over the road for a period of time. That's just, that's just how it is. 
But the sad part of it, well, first of all, they're probably okay with that. Um, but their experience generally is not great. And so you get a lot of attrition and not just like they leave and go to a different job. They just leave the industry altogether and say, this isn't for me. And that's a problem. And it's sort of like, uh, I would look at this very much like I look at, at my business. If you bring on a new customer, that onboarding process is really important, right? Because you can, if, if that doesn't go well, they're probably not going to stick around. The same is applicable to to a new driver, right? This is new, uncharted territory. They're kind of, you know, they hear that you can make good money here and it's a great industry. And of course, you're hearing such positive things about it, you know, because of COVID. And then you get into it and you're like, well, this is awful. This isn't anything. I mean, so we can't have that. We, we, and it's, it's not like the industry can choose this. This is at a company level that they're going to make sure that that's a much better experience for the driver. And uh, those are the types of companies that are going to have the most success, not only and be able to grow if that's what they want to do, but certainly prevent the uh, the turnover that is otherwise just plagues the industry. Hey, Jeremy, you'll you'll appreciate this. Uh, a, a friend of mine, and you who you may know, Eric Eversol, with uh, runs hiring our heroes. I mean, so doing great job, great work uh, hiring veterans, not just in trucking, but in many industries. He used a term that that just struck at the heart of something I've been frustrated at, especially on the front end of this funnel where we've been working a lot on trying to attract people to get the training or, or just, you know, dispel the misnomers in the, of what it means to be a professional driver or a diesel technician, et cetera. And he said, you know, the, the industries and the companies that have been most successful have been the ones who've been able to eliminate the ambiguity of what it, how to get in the industry and what it means to be. And he used the example of the military. He's like, as, as, as complex as the military is, it's pretty simple. you you fill out your form and then you go to boot camp and then you're there for this period of time and you do this, this and that. I mean, there, there's no confusion um, right. about what one has to do, you know, to, to join the military. And I think because the, the trucking industry is so uh, diverse um, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, CD people who need CDL drivers are way beyond just the, you know, the motor carrier industry, construction, et cetera, that, that there's just a lot of ambiguity about, entering the training and then entering the industry. And so uh, you, any ideas on how we can, how we can maybe eliminate some of that confusion? Well, that's applicable to any, anything, any business I would say too. Right. I mean, it's kind of one of those things that if you, if you hire people, which you, you have to make sure that there are very clear upfront expectations and what, you know, what they're, what to expect, clear direction, and then there's accountability and all those sorts of things. And so I think, when you apply that to the industry, the hard part is it, that's not an industry thing. That's an individual company thing, to your point. It's so diverse. And, but still, if companies got to be looking around going, why is it so hard for us to hire and recruit or retain drivers? And what I like about Atri um, is, is every, you know, they do this annual survey every year, top 10 industry issues. And they do it. They survey both fleets and drivers. And, you know. No surprise, the last five years in a row, number one issue, driver shortage. Number two issue, driver retention. And so that's, a, that's, that's through the lens of the fleet, right, for the carrier. Now you look at the drivers and you look at their information. What, you know what their you know, top two or three issues are? Truck parking, compensation. Uh, those are big things, right? So you're like, okay, if I'm really trying to solve my problem, then I should consider this through their lens. What are the things that matter to them? If I can solve for that, then I'm going to go a long way in, in making people happy and providing a place for them to, to want to stick around for a long time. I'm still trying to figure out that, I mean, the truck parking thing is a big deal and it's not an easy thing to be like, done, you know, but but there are things that companies are doing, you know, making sure that they're providing a secure spot for them. I mean, that comes at a cost, but is that, is that, a, is that a better way to, you know, spend money than constantly advertising and recruiting for drivers because they keep leaving because, because they run out of place to park and they're not efficient with, uh, you know, just with, with operating, you know, within the confines of hours of service because they're trying to find parking. No, and well, I think, you know, that kind of goes hand in hand with kind of what I was wanting to get your perspective on of, you know, talking at the company level, 
how are some of the ways that you're seeing companies, you know, I guess the success, most successful companies differentiate themselves, uh, you know, from a recruiting perspective when, you know, trying to recruit drivers? I, number one is just got to be real, just be human, yeah. have empathy. You know, when you're talking to the driver, especially, you know what they've been through the last couple of years, it's been tough. And just be honest. I mean, and, and don't, that's good. You can connect. I mean, that's the one thing I would say silver lining or, you know, you hear people say never let a good crisis go to waste. What a great opportunity to really connect at a much deeper level than normal. This isn't just 2022. This is two years after we've been going through some crap. All of us. We've lost people. We've been challenged in ways at the fan, at the home, at, at, in work. So you can really connect in a way that's so much more human and more empathetic. And I think companies that do that and then leverage technology. Um, and that's that's certainly not a plug for what I do. The point is, A, technology aside, you can have all the best technology in the world. If you're not helping and you're not engaging and, and connecting at a human level, then it's not you're not going to be successful. You really do need uh, to be human. Um, and, and make sure that that technology is only enhancing the opportunity and connectivity to be human, not, not replacing it. But I think it's, it's, it's really that simple because at the end of the day, all of it, we're all just people who the world and life is all around us that it's okay. Let's talk about it. We're on zoom. My kids could come barreling in here any second and it is what it is. Sorry. You know, and, we're each other's home. Like, that's just, that's good. I, I, I like that. Yeah. Well, no, but first off, uh, plug your stuff. Go, go use driver reach. Don't do not. No, that's why we brought you on here. Plug your stuff, uh, Jeremy. Don't, don't hesitate there. But um, no, I mean, I, and I know when we work with drivers at the trucking fitness company, by no means is it as strong of a relationship as, you know, when they're, with their employee. Uh, but what I'm seeing on my back end and looking at the data and, you know, drivers uh, turnover in our program is the ones that we have a personal connection with that we take the time and we build that relationship with are the ones staying around. They're the ones opening the app. They're the ones who are losing weight in the long run and, and doing the most workouts and showing up. And the ones that we drop the ball or we play phone tag and then something happens and we don't keep, we don't keep that relationship are the ones that turn over. Um, and I think that personal relationship is everything. And then especially at the beginning, if you set that standard at the beginning, uh, it goes a long way. So I, I mean, I completely agree with you. And, um, you know, I think talking about driver reach, we wanted to first off, congratulations on, uh, you know, the last funding round that that's amazing. That's huge. I would love to hear uh, kind of where you see driver reach going in the next five to 10 years. Well, appreciate that. Uh, it, it's exciting because I, you know, bootstrapped it up, up up until that point, and and sort of once you're sort of backed, if you will, right? It's sort of sort of you've arrived. There's a legitimacy that comes with that, and you know what I learned getting into the trucking industry, uh, and then starting to build technology. Technology is not my background. That's not my level of you know my forte. But what I learned is if you can find people that can build technology. You can build whatever you want, you know? So if you think it, you can build it. In fact, I remember as we were early on, uh, build, even before driver reach, I was saying like, could you make it do this? And could you make it do this? And he said, Jeremy can make it do whatever you want. It's just how much are you willing to spend and how important is it? Right. And so that really opened up. You're like, okay, so I have a blank canvas here. And that's really exciting when it comes to technology. But again, that's not my background. And when I sold the staffing company and you get into, you know, software, we are a B2B SaaS company, right? Um, that's what we are, specifically in the HR and recruiting tech space, which in trucking is, is uh, very deficient. Now, there are other way more innovative and progressive industries that have a lot of different options, but this is a highly regulated industry. And that's the industry that we serve, right? The trucking industry. So what I recognize, and one of the, the things that was really valuable with the funding and the partner that we have is they are experts in B2B SaaS, you know, and, and they are operators, all former operators in a B2B SaaS environment. So um, there's a lot that, that we can learn, and that's going to just help us be more successful, 
always understanding that in any in any company and certainly a subscription based company, you've got to make sure that you're always providing value to that customer or they will leave. <laughs> you know, so and that's OK. That's accountability. And that's that's a good thing. Uh, what what excites me about what the future holds is, again, it, you have a clean slate, you know, you can you, or a clean canvas, you can you can build whatever you want. The things that matter the most around that around driver recruiting, compliance, um, driver qualification file compliance specifically, uh, that's that goes hand in hand with recruiting. Right. Uh, not just in the applicant in qualification process, but as long as that driver throughout that driver's tenure with the company, uh, there is there are requirements, you know, for from a compliance standpoint. So because we're the system of record for all of their applicants, for their current drivers, and even their former drivers data, you know, uh, previous employment history information, being able to partner and or acquire companies that are all around that driver life cycle um, are the things that get me excited because we can be a place where, uh, again, I, I'm not doing this to be rich. I'm doing this because I saw a need in the industry and I want to help. The byproduct, though, if you execute and do that right and surround yourself with the right people, is you'll be successful. And you'll look up and you'll be like, wow, we're doing pretty good. <laughs> but, but that's not the motivator. You know, the motivator is that's right. you. And so we're sitting here talking about the driver shortage or we're, we're talking about 18 year olds. That means nothing to my business. I just know it's a big problem and I want to be a part of the solution. That stuff gets me excited. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. And uh, yeah, I, I resonate with uh, that kind of mission driven attitude. And, and that was kind of the whole motivation behind, well, why I wake up every morning too. And, and I'm excited about uh, the work I do too. But um, thank you for coming on the show, Jeremy. I, I guess if people want to hear, well, I guess, Colson, you got anything else? No, I'm just, I'm ready to go run through the brick wall for Jeremy, man. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. Uh, if people want to learn more about driver reach or uh, hear your voice more on the podcast, where can they find you? Well, like Mark said, I'm everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> uh, definitely driverreach.com. Uh, I'm really easy to find on LinkedIn. I'm, I've been engaged on that platform. I think since they, since it started 12 years ago or so. And, uh, and so those are easy places to find me and, uh, I'll be at a lot of industry events. That's, that's one thing is again, this is, it's family and it's, it's nice to get back out. I'm really excited. 2022 will be a big year in being able to get out and, and honestly, just, just hug some of your friends and people that you haven't seen in a couple of years. So I'll be in Alabama. So looking forward to that. Yes, sir. Awesome. Yes, sir. Awesome. Well, I'm in St. Louis. You're in Indy. Not not Indianapolis. You're in, or, or are you in Indianapolis? Yeah, so, so, uh, yeah I'm su suburban Indianapolis, Carmel. Okay, okay. At some point, we're gonna have to meet in person too. For so, sure. uh, but I appreciate you coming on the show. Everyone listening, you got to hold Mark and I accountable to to keeping this going, this podcast going. We're going to, we're going to. Uh, but uh, especially now that you're Doctor Manera, I mean, that's you, right. You have no excuse. Uh, I do have an excuse, but. Everyone's got an excuse. Uh, but okay. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time. It's more than just a living, y'all. Hell, it's our way of life. We're the last of the cowboys. The giddy up gone, boys. Eighteen wheels on the concrete. It's a slow and dying breed. Rolling like Jesse James. A modern day outlaw game. If you're out here riding with me, come on back and make some noise. The last of the cowboys